As it turns out, you all are in for a bit of a break today. I had some oral surgery earlier this week. And when I said to the surgeon, you know how you gave me that clergy discount on my surgery? Well, about that, I said, I wonder, do you think I'll be able to preach by Sunday? And he said with a bit of grin, I think so, but you might want to cut your sermon a little short. <laughs> That's advice from the dentist. Pretty good advice as it turns out. So today we get right to the point. Our text for today is from the Gospel of John. It takes place right after Jesus' friend Lazarus was raised from the dead. And right before Jesus enters Jerusalem and kind of kickstarts all of the all of the passion, all of the events of Holy Week. Penny times in this house where Jesus was greeted by his friends. The air in the room is thick with a sense of danger and apprehension and wondering what might be next. It seems like everyone knows that whatever might be next, it's not going to be good. Let us listen for the word of God. Today's reading is from John 12, 1 for 8. Please feel free to work, read along by turning to page 106 in the New Testament for your key Bibles. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them under her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why is this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it the day of my marriage. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. In the spirit of wisdom, guide our understanding of the scripture. Thanks be to God. We pray with me. Easy way to say no, no thank you. The waiter asks, did you all leave room enough for dessert? 
dessert tonight, and someone at the table is going to say, oh, no, I'm good. Thank you, though. It's nice to have such a simple way of saying no. If everyone is at the party and someone innocently asks the recovering alcoholic, can I get you a glass of wine? The guest doesn't need to go into the whole story, right? She can just say, yeah, I'm good, thanks. Sometimes I'm good makes the conversation go much easier. Other times I'm good means, you know what? I am full. I am satisfied. I have had way more than enough. The scripture that Denise read for us today came from the Gospel of John. And one of the things that is unique about the Gospel of John is that John's Jesus is kind of a kind of a superhuman, superhero kind of Jesus. In the first three Gospels, Jesus is kind of a regular guy. But by the time John was written, which was about 30 years later, Jesus had gotten to be larger than life, like people do further on after they're gone. My dad's been gone now for 15 years, and the further away that gets, the larger he is than life. We know how that happens. And that was especially true of Jesus. So, in the Gospel of John, whenever Jesus is around in all these stories, he's not like a, a regular guy. It's more like he's a super savior. He has this presence, this aura about him. He might look like a man, but in John, Jesus is more than he seems to be. We may have some Star Trek fans in the room here. John sees us as like a heavenly person who has beamed down from our planet for a while. The Word made flesh. And then after the crucifixion, beamed back up again to reign in heaven, the top floor of the universe. Kind of a superhero. And as a consequence of this, in John's Gospel, whenever Jesus appears, there is this radical abundance that accompanies him. Some of y'all may remember the story. The first miracle story in the Gospel of John is the story when Jesus changed the water into wine at the wedding feast. He didn't just change a few pitchers of water into wine. Jesus changed like a whole swimming pool of water into a whole swimming pool of wine. When Jesus met the woman at the well, he didn't just chat with her. He, he told her her whole story that he couldn't have possibly known. Abundance that flows out of Jesus because he isn't really human. He's more. In the Gospel of John, there is an abundance that follows Jesus around. Or as the other might say, abundant God's grace was in Jesus' presence. And this story is no exception. Mary purchased some really expensive oil, the kind that he reserved not just for any occasion, but to spread on the body of someone who had just died, and whose body was being prepared for burial. Expensive oil, once in a lifetime oil. Oil that cost 300 denarii, probably a, a month's wages. Mary brought this oil to the house where Lazarus lived. Because Jesus had been telling his disciples that his time was about to come. It was about to die. It was Passover time. So Mary, she was just getting prepared. She was bringing the oil, so she had it with her. But, but when Jesus showed up in the house with this presence, this aura that he had, it was abundance. It was, it was too much for Mary. She was overwhelmed by that presence, and so she used all that oil that she had saved all that time for. She used it all on Jesus right then to anoint Jesus' feet while he's still very much alive, rather than to wait until he was gone. In John's Gospel, there's an aura of plenty that permeates the text. For the most part, for the most part, all of us are hardwired to, to not feel a sense of plenty, to want what we don't yet have. The next thing, a child is playing in our nursery very contentedly with a toy 
playing for a while, totally absorbed and engaged. And then another child comes into the nursery and starts playing with a different boy. And the child who was once so content now wants precisely what the other child has. No longer satisfied with what had been just plenty minutes before. It's so much a part of our nature to want what we don't yet have, what we, what we see is right out there, to feel less than enough. Our kids may have a drawer full of Shopkins, which I just learned about last week, but they will invariably focus not only on the one they don't have, but on the one that the coolest kid in the class does that. We want what we don't yet have, and it's always been that way, whether we're kids or adults. But in John's gospel, whenever Jesus arrives, there's, there's, there's plenty, there's more than enough. It's as if John was saying, take just a moment and, and look at the world, not in terms of, of what you lack, but just take that moment and look at the world in your lives in terms of what you have. That's what Jesus brings, abundance, enough. I had a friend at the church where I used to work, he worked there too. His name was Herb, Herb Hamlin. He was our custodian for years. But before he was our custodian, he served as a cook during World War II in Great Britain. And Herb's claim to fame was that one day he served lunch to Winston Churchill. To Winston Churchill. It was the defining moment of Herb's life. He remembers Churchill eating the entire meal without ever taking a cigar out of his mouth. <laughs> he loved to tell the story. And he remembered how Churchill got up from the meal, as he was accustomed to doing, the meal that Herb had just served him, and say, gentlemen, I have just enjoyed an elegance of sufficiency. Whenever you ask her, when you were at the table, you ask her, Herb, you had enough? I have had an elegance of sufficiency. That's one way of saying it, right? That's the way Herb said it. But there is a simpler way. Sometimes when the question is, do you need anything else? All we need to say is, no, I'm good. And indeed, one thing that Christ has to teach us is that in spite of all that's out there that we do not have, 